Hello again and welcome to the Warhammer 40k Imperial Guard Tactics video. Now before we get into today's video, I would like to say a huge thank you to Hero for sending in some awesome pictures of his Imperial Guard Super Heavy Diorama. Absolutely awesome. I really, really like the effects that have been done here with the Super Heavies kicking up dust, the infantry scrabbling between their tracks, the little Medic 10, all of it is really, really cool. It's fantastic to see this level of detail and love being put into a diorama. It's just awesome. So massive thank you to here for sending these pictures in and if anyone else has got any cool pictures they want me to use in my videos then please post them on my face page or you can email them to me at mordenglorytv at gmail.com. And don't worry if you're like me and you've got Ogre and Brain, you've not been upgraded to a Bonehead yet, there will be links and everything down in the description below. Without further ado, let's crack on with today's video. Now today guys, I thought it would only be appropriate to talk about some Super Heavies considering we've got some pictures of them on the screen. And what I want to do is take a look at our Codex Super Heavies and work out, in my opinion, which ones are worth taking on the battle, which ones are competitive and which ones are maybe just fun choices or even then maybe just not very good at all. So why am I talking about this? Because for the longest time, my advice has always been don't bother with the Guard Super Heavies, they're just not worth it. Well, the thing is with recent changes, thanks to the balanced data slates such as Armour of Contempt and Hammer of the Emperor, we're now starting to see that some of these guys who babies are not only viable, but they're actually even somewhat competitive, which is really good because the guards super heavies are really cool and it's nice to be able to see them on the tabletop again. And I have to tell you guys, I've been seeing this more and more people taking their super heavies into games, even taking them into like local events, and actually doing pretty well with them. So let's take a look at these codex super heavies and work out which ones are actually viable in your competitive guard list. Now, before we take a look at the actual units themselves there's a couple of ground rules that I want to establish here. Firstly, depending on whether any of these units are going to be competitive will entirely depend on the format of the event or the game that you're playing. So for example, if you're playing a normal game of Warhammer 40k or maybe even a, a competitive game that uses like player place terrain or the tables aren't super saturated, basically if you're not playing on what is called WTC style terrain, then your Bane Blades and your other Super Heavies will be viable. However, if you're playing on a very dense board, we're talking WTC or things like it, then you're going to find no matter which one of these options you pick, you're going to struggle. Okay, And the reason for that is, is that Bane Blades are quite big and they unfortunately will not be able to traverse around all forms of boards. Despite the fact they're a super heavy tank, they can't bulldoze through vehicles, okay? The breachable keyword doesn't apply to them, it just applies to infantry. So that's one thing you need to take into account. Firstly, what kind of terrain are you expecting? If you're building your list, you should know what kind of terrain is gonna be at that event. It should be a standard little bit of homework that you do. So you should know what kind of terrain you're going to expect and that will determine before you even look at the variants if you're going to be taking a super heavy or not. Now, the other thing you're gonna to want to take into account when you're taking one of these things is what battlefield role is it going to perform in my list? And that's really, really important. Just slapping a super heavy in there whilst being cool may not be adding much to your list if you've already got a hell of a lot of armor and you're just adding more armor on top of it are you perhaps not really getting as much out of the bane blade as you want or are you thinking well if i take this big bane blade it's going to protect my tank commanders it doesn't really matter but what you've just got to think about is when you're taking this unit you need to be thinking of a battlefield role for it. it's too big it's too costly an investment to just be thrown into a list for me, I tend to find Super Heavies come down to two battlefield roles. Either they're going to be serious fire support, or you want them to be cheap enough, but deadly enough that they become quite an effective distraction kind of effects, where essentially they're not that a big chunk out of your list, but your opponent has to deal with them because they've got enough firepower, but if they're dealing with the Bane Blade, then they're not dealing with other stuff. So for me, I tend to find Super Heavies fall into two those two roles. Fire support, and distraction card effects. But those are the first two things I just wanted to mention before we take a look at the units themselves. Now let's dive into each one of these Codex Super Heavies and work out which ones are better and which ones are worse. So the first Super Heavy we're going to take a look at is the Bane Blade, the classic, the El Classico Super Heavy tank that you can get for your Imperial Guard forces. Now, a lot of these guys are gonna have similar profiles. So for example, the Bane Blade has got movement of 10, Weapon skill 5+, plus, Ballistic skill 4+, plus, Strength 9, Toughness 8, Wound 26, Attacks 9, Leadership 8, and a 2+, plus save. Now, obviously these things degrade, so whilst it has 
14 to 26 wounds. It has a 10 inch move, 4 plus ballistic skill, 9 attacks. But at the moment you get it down to 13 wounds, it goes to a 7 inch move, ballistic skill 5 plus, and only 6 attacks. But when you get it down to 1 to 6 wounds, then it's only got a 4 inch move, a ballistic skill of 6 plus, and only 3 attacks. So that's just something to be aware. It does degrade, and it degrades in its ballistic skill, which is very important because if you're thinking about this as, as a fire support unit, if it degrades a business skill, that's not great. Now, to be clear, all of the super heavies have the same stats. They've got the same number of wounds, they've got the same degradation profile. So that's just something to be aware of for all of them. Now, the Bane Blade is a classic fire support unit in my mind. For its points, it's 410 points base at the time of recording this video. And for each set of sponsors you want to add on to it, it is an additional 30 points. Now, you have to take these sponsors in pairs. So if you want to take one set of sponsors, it's 30 times 2, so that's 60 points. And if you want to take four sponsors, then that is 120 points. So this unit can vary anywhere for between 410 points and 530 points. The vast majority of people when they're building a super heavy will tend to build them with one set of sponsors and the reason for that is because the kit comes with one set of sponsors and if you want to buy more sponsors you have to get those separately it's a separate upgrade kit from gw so most of the time people are going to be buying these things with one set of sponsors but it's not uncommon to see them with no sponsors or with four set of sponsors but we're for the sake of this video we're going to be assuming that people are going to be slapping an extra set of sponsors where appropriate on there Okay, now for the Bane Blade, it certainly is appropriate to take those extra sponsors. It comes with a lot of firepower, but in my experience, it just needs that little bit of extra firepower to just make it do that battlefield role of being a fire support unit. Now, overall, it costs about 470 points with a set of sponsors. Uh, it's good, but it's about middle of the pack. It's not the most expensive of these super heavies that you're going to come across, but it's not the cheapest. It's bang in the middle. It is the one that all of the super heavies are going to be compared against. It is the tactical marine of super heavies. It does a little bit of everything. Okay. Now its firepower is considerable. It comes with an auto cannon, a bane blade cannon, a demarcher cannon, twin heavy bolter, and then you start adding those sponsors on. It comes with four more heavy bolters and two last cannons. Okay. Now that is a lot of firepower. And the Bane Blade Cannon, for example, has a 72 inch range. It's heavy 3D6, which is an average of 10 shots every time it fires. And it has a strength of nine, an AP of three, which is great for breaking through armor of contempt. It's not like AP2 or anything stupid, it's AP3. And it's also got a damage by three, which is again, fantastic because whenever you're shooting at anything that might reduce damage by one, doesn't matter. They're still gonna be taking at least two damage. So for me, the Bane Blade is an easy, easy one to say okay it is a good choice i think if i was going into a tournament and i wasn't sure what i was going to face but i knew i wanted to take a super heavy that would be effective i would take the bane blade every single time it is my go-to super heavy i'm not going to lie guys there are other ones out there which are more specialists which will be able to do certain roles better the bane blade isn't necessarily the best super heavy for the guard by no means but it's certainly the one that you could slot into a list and go right this thing's going to do something every game. It's going to be okay. I'm not weakening myself by taking this particular super heavy variant. So that's why I like the Bane Blade so much. And for me, it gets the big thumbs up. Now, if I'm looking at the middle of the pack, now let's look at one of the cheapest super heavies you can take, which is the Bane Hammer. Now, the Bane Hammer has the same wounds and blister skill and degradation as the Bane Blade, but where it differs is its special rules and the weapons that it comes with. Now, obviously, its main cannon is going to be different. You've got the Bane Blade cannon on the Bane Blade, and you've got the Tremor cannon on the Bane Hammer. But to be clear, it's actually lacking some of the other weapons that the Bane Blade comes with. So it only comes with the Tremor cannon, and the twin heavy bolts. It doesn't come with the auto cannon and it doesn't come with the martial cannon, okay? So that's just something you need to be aware of when you're looking at the points cost of this thing. Yeah, it's 40 points cheaper, but you're missing out on an auto cannon, which is about 10 points, and you're missing out on the martial cannon as well. So just be aware of that. Now, the main gun of the Bane Hammer is a really interesting one. It's not overly powerful, but it has a really cool rule, okay? So the Tremor Cannon, it's got a 60 inch range, it's a little bit short range than the Bane Blade Cannon. It's heavy, 3d6, that's the same number of shots. It's strength eight, it's only AP two, which is okay, but you shoot this thing at Marines in cover and they're basically ignoring the AP there, but its damage is still three, which is nice. Still gonna take a chunk out of something. However, the main thing about this gun is if a unit is hit by this weapon, now you don't need to kill anything, you just need to hit them, right? If a unit is hit by this weapon, in their following movement phase, they must half their move characteristic and they cannot advance. So it's quite interesting because it doesn't 
slap the enemy as hard, but the tactical implications of that are massive. I don't think they can be overstated, okay? If your opponent has got a unit that they want to be able to move onto an objective, but then they can't because you've hit them with the Quake Cannon, the, sorry, the Tremor Cannon, that's going to be a big problem. They might have had plans to move on to an objective and be able to then do an action, but now they can't. So they've just got to move and they can't advance. They just, they just can't do anything they want to do. Okay, so whilst the Bane Hammer on the surface is like, oh, has it got the Auto Cannon, has it got the Demarch Cannon, I think the Bane Hammer actually in 9th edition is crazy, crazy strong. Because like I said, if you're facing people who want to be running around doing actions and you just be like, no, your movement is just halved, you cannot advance, you just, you're not going where you want to go, it's pretty big. Now, the one thing you could also say is if you're facing, it's not just about objectives, but if you're facing a heavy assault army, and one of the things that Guard really struggles with is taking, but then holding ground against assault units. Well, this thing's really going to help you with that. If you've taken like a flank objective and the enemy hasn't got the whole army, they can just pour onto the side of that objective and take it off you. Maybe they've just got one or two units. Well, now you slap the tremor cannon into them and suddenly they're not able to take that objective off you or apply as much force that objective. It's big. Okay, so the Bane Hammer, it hasn't got as much punch. But it's, it's sort of tactical implications, it's knock-on effect on the points that your opponent can score, on the points that you might be scoring, is pretty big. Now, it does also come with a firing deck. So this thing can transport 25 infantry, and 10 of them can shoot out of the top. It's a nice little rule, but it's not one that I would overly put too much stock in for this variant. Okay, It can transport some stuff, but its main effect is that tremor cannon okay that's really what you want it for so the fact that it can transport 25 infantry for me i would say look if you've got some units that you want to be able to shoot out the top of this thing go for it but there's no point in over stacking it with 25 infantry the moment you've got the 10 in there that can shoot out the fire because it can transport 25 but only 10 can shoot you see the moment you've got those 10 firing slots picked up I wouldn't bother putting any more units in there. For me, I can't really think of anything that I want to put in there. Heavy weapon teams, they want to be out back, you know, doing the mortar pit thing. I don't know. It doesn't really... I can't really think of much I want to put in there. You know, maybe it's got a veterans, but, you know, if you don't want to be spending loads of points on veterans, it's difficult. Command squads, maybe, traditionally, but now command squads like to do things with, like, flags and stuff like that and box gases, so... It's a tricky one for me. I don't know. Um, I don't think that the firing deck is overly helpful, but if you've got any suggestions for what you'd put in it, let me know down in the comments section below. Now, one thing I do want to mention about the Bane Hammer is that it doesn't have quite as much firepower as the Bane Blade, okay? It doesn't have the Demarcher Cannon, it doesn't have the Auto Cannon, but like we said, it is cheaper. Now, that doesn't mean it necessarily has to have less firepower than the Bane Blade, okay? Because it's cheaper, you can potentially afford to put an extra set of sponsors this thing. So rather than just going for one set of sponsors, which I think it absolutely needs, without it, it just doesn't have enough firepower, but you could definitely afford to put two sets of sponsors this thing. Now, if you put two sets of sponsors on it, it comes to 490 points, which is only 20 points more expensive than the Bane Blade. Okay, it is more expensive, but it's only 20 points more expensive. You then combine that the fact that maybe you've got a squad or two in the back shooting some weapons out, and suddenly this thing has the firepower to match the Bane Blade, but it also has those cool rules on the Tremor Cannon. So if it's not immediately obvious, I'm giving this one the thumbs up as well. The Bane Blade and the Bane Hammer are two solid unit choices, and I think both of them fall into that category of, well, you know, it's got good firepower and it's got good ability to be slotted into any list and to be useful. So I like the Bane Hammer, it gets my thumbs up. So moving on to another of the cheaper super heavies. In fact, this is the joint cheaper super heavy with the Bane Hammer. We have the Bane Sword. Now the Bane Sword is very similar to the Bane Hammer. It's not got the Demarche Can, it's not got the Auto Can, it just comes with its main gun and the twin heavy bolter, and it degrades in all the same ways. Alright? So what is its main weapon? It has a Quake Cannon. Now, the Quake Cannon is has got 140 inch range. That's a very, very long range. More range than you're ever going to need in a game of 140k 9th edition. It fires heavy 2d6 shots. Now, this is the first time we've seen something that isn't firing 3d6 shots. It's firing 2d6 shots, okay? Now, it's strength 14, it's AP4, and it's d6 damage, but... When you're rolling the damage for this weapon, it does a minimum of three. Okay, so it counts a one or a two as a three as instead. Okay, so that's quite good. It's doing a minimum of three, but it has potential to spike up. Now, bear in mind this thing doesn't have a gun deck. So it's cheaper, 
and it's purely dedicated towards firepower. Now, I'm not 100% sold on the Bane Sword as a firepower platform, and the reason for that is, quite simply, its main gun to me is too unreliable in the terms of number of shots. At least with Heavy 3D6, you have a good chance of one of the dice coming up being relatively good, and you should always be getting that sort of 10 average shots from the cannon, okay? With Heavy 2D6, it's just not got the same reliability. Think about it yourself, guys. How many times have you fired your Manticore and it's not got the number of shots you've wanted? How many times have you fired a tank commander, you've double shot him with grinding advance, and he hasn't got the shots that you wanted, okay? It just happens every game, right? Every game something happens, and sometimes you've got the CP or the regiment traits to manipulate it, but sometimes you don't. So for me, Heavy 2D6 is very, very swingy, and that's why I'm not a big fan of the Bane Sword, but I do like its strength 14, I do like its AP 4, I do like its minimum damage of 3, and I do like the fact it's so cheap. I mean, at the end of the day, guys, this is the budget the budget Bane Blade, right? This is the most budget one you're going to get, and you pay for what you get. Okay, yeah, I'm only getting heavy 2d6 shots, and those shots are better than the Bane Blade cannon, guys. Straight up, they are better. But I'm paying 40 points less for this thing. And again, I could just slap a unit, or I could slap a set of sponsors on this thing, and its firepower then is perfectly respectable. It's 430 points. For me, I think this is the first of the Super Heavies that I would possibly class as a distraction card effect. You'd want to keep this one pretty cheap, okay? I would resist the temptation to try and make up for its sort of random number of shots by putting as many sponsors on it as possible. I think you could possibly get away with just putting the one set of sponsors on. I mean, definitely get away with putting the one set of sponsors on. And then it's got enough firepower that it's a threat. Uh, there is always a a crazy idea that you could pay for no sponsors on this thing. I don't like that idea, I'll be honest. Because, yeah, you're trying to keep it as cheap as possible, 370 points, great. I'm just going to run it around and it's just going to look intimidating. The problem is, is that it's going to, the illusion is going to shatter very quickly. If you're trying to be intimidating with this unit and it fires its main cannon and gets two shots and then does no damage. And your opponent very quickly is going to go, it's not even a distraction kind of effect, it's just a big bag of shit. Okay, it's actually not doing anything to me. Yeah, this thing might be able to run some people over with Crush there, and Adamantium Tracks, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, it could do that. But I think a Distraction Card Effects has to be a viable threat. And I think if you don't put some sponsors on this thing, it doesn't become a viable threat. But then, the Catch-22 is you've then spent 60 points on something that was meant to be cheap and distracting. And I have to ask myself, would it be better to just take a Bare Bones Bane Blade? Because the Bare Bones Bane Blade has got a cannon that's actually reliable, and it comes with a Demarche Cannon, and it comes with an Auto Cannon, and it's actually 20 points cheaper than taking a Bane Sword with a set of sponsors. So for me, it just feels like it's an okay unit, and it feels like it should be a cheap distraction card effect, but I'm not sure it does that cheap distraction card effects job any better than a Bare Bane Blade would do. So... I'm not a big fan of the Bane Sword. I'd like to get your guys' opinions on it, but I'm a big fan of it. For me, despite the fact that it's pretty cheap, it gets the thumbs down. Now, moving on to another of the budget Super Heavies, we've got the Doom Hammer. Now, this one's a little bit more expensive at a base point of 380. It is, again, one that does not come with the Marsh Cannon, and it does not come with an Auto Cannon. It just has the main gun and then Twin Heavy Bolter, and then if you want more firepower, you're going to need to put some sponsors on it. Now, this thing does come with a firing deck. So, like the Bane Hammer, it does have that ability to get a little bit of extra firepower out of its firing deck, okay? Now, its main gun is the Magma Cannon, and it's kind of similar to the last one we looked at, the Quake Cannon, okay? It's only got a 60-inch range, but that's fine. You never go need more 60-inch range in 40k 9th edition. It only fires heavy 2d6. I don't like that low reliability. It's strength 10, it's AP 5, it's D6 damage, and if the target is within half range of weapon, roll two dice when inflicting damage with it and discard the lowest result. I'm going to be straight up with you guys, I don't like this one, okay? Again, it's heavy 2D6 isn't enough for me, and I don't really understand why this one is more expensive than the Bane Sword. I think it purely comes down to the fact that GW has slapped an extra 10 points on it for its firing deck. 
Uh, I don't really like the main gun on this one. I mean, the strength 10 is fine, the AP5 is fine, but the damage output is unreliable. In fact, it's the least reliable of any of them that we've got. It's kind of like a Vanquisher cannon. And Vanquisher cannon, I don't do, do I need to say anymore, guys. Do I really say anymore? No, I don't. The only thing I would say is that this potentially can be a very cheap distraction card effects. And why is that? Because potentially you don't need to pay for much more firepower on this thing, okay? Now bear with me. Because it has a firing deck, if you've already got some fire support units in your army, then you could upgun the firepower of this thing without having to spend any more points on it. Have you got a heavy weapon squad that you haven't put mortars in for some reason? Have you got some kind of unit in your army that you can put in the back of this thing to give it 10 extra good shots? Maybe it's some scions with some plasma guns or something. Have you got some extra firepower that can go in this unit that increases its firepower and makes it a more credible threat but doesn't increase its base points cost? If you do, then I think the Doomhammer is actually, whilst it potentially suffers from the same problem as the Bane Sword, can just about have a battlefield role as a very cheap distraction card effect. So you just take this thing, you put no upgrades on it, you just stick people in the back that you are already taking. That's the key to it. Already taking. If you're taking units to fill this thing up with to try and get some more firepower to it, then you've already failed. Okay, the point is that this thing needs to be just getting extra firepower for no extra cost. I think if you do that, it potentially has a battlefield role. But again, for me, I feel like these two units, you know, the Bane Sword and the Doom Hammer, they just aren't cutting it for me. I think that you get what you pay for with these two, and I don't like it, to be honest. And this isn't me ragging on all the cheap super heavies, because I told you I liked the Bane Hammer. I thought the Bane Hammer was great, okay? I just don't like the Bane Sword, and I don't like the Doom Hammer, okay? So for me, I think the Doom Hammer gets a partial thumbs down but it does potentially have some way you can make it work now going from the budget end of the super heavies right up to the premium end we have the most expensive base point cost super heavy which is the hell hammer this thing comes in at 450 points base but you do get a lot of firepower for that okay you do get the auto cannon the demarcher cannon a hell hammer cannon a twin heavy bolter and a las gun yeah that's right a bit weird but it has a little point defense las gun sticking out the back of it it's kind of cute now for that what is the hell hammer cannon that's the big question right what am i paying to that what am i getting for such a hefty price tag right well, you get a 36 inch range. I'm just gonna stop there one second. I think that's actually a massive disadvantage for this tank, the 36 inch range. We've all been there, right? You're rocking around with the execution of plasma cannons or your heavy bolters and you feel like, yeah, I've got enough firepower, I've got enough range. But then you come across someone who actually has a longer range than you. And as a guard player, that's quite an uncomfortable for you to be in, okay? We are meant to outrange people. We are meant to outshoot people. And if you have to spend a turn not shooting and getting into position, it's not ideal. So. I don't like the 36 inch range and I've just been in many situations when that has been a problem, okay? Now it does have heavy 3d6 shots, which is good. Strength 10, which is good. AP4, which is good. Damage 3, which is good. And units do not get the benefit of cover when shot at by the Hellhammer cannon, just for, for their saving throw. So it doesn't ignore like dents or anything like that. It just ignores plus one armor save, okay? Now, despite this firepower, I'm just gonna come out and say it, guys. I don't think I like the Hellhammer. I think it's gonna get a thumbs down. And the reason for that is it's just so very, very expensive points-wise. 450 points base is eye-watering. You're still, still gonna need to slap on a set of sponsors thing because its job is clearly a firepower tank, okay? So then you're looking at 510 points and it just seems really, really expensive. And I just have to ask myself, what am I getting more firepower out of? This thing with one set of sponsors or like the Bane Hammer, you know, the one with the, the big bloody Bane Hammer cannon, the Tremor cannon with those four sets of sponsors. That actually comes in at cheaper. With four sponsors, that thing comes cheaper than the Hell Hammer with one set of sponsors. I mean, it's just, it's just mad. I just think... The Hellhammer is too expensive. It's good. Don't get me wrong. If you start stacking that thing up against the Bane Blade, you're like, okay, it's pretty good, you know, because the Bane Blade shooting at a intercessor in cover. 
that incest is still going to get a 4 up save because it's in cover, so it's on a 2 plus. It reduces the AP by 1 because of Armor Contempt, and then basically the Baneblade Cannon is only AP 2, so it's got a 4 plus save, right? But the Hellhammer puts that Tactical Marine, that Incessor, onto a 6 up save. So don't get me wrong, it's powerful, okay? It is powerful, but it's but is is it worth 40 points more? I'm just not sure it is. I'm just not sure it is. And you know, you could you could happily take an Astropath in your army, you should be doing anyway. And the Astropath can give you the same result on the Bane Blade Cannon, but it's cheaper because of Astral Divination, you can ignore cover. And that Ashpath can also, it's not like he's, he's only doing that, right? He can give your Bane Blade a better save or a minus one to hit. <sighs> I just think the Hellhammer's too expensive, guys, and for that reason is why I begrudgingly, very begrudgingly, because I own one of these things and I think it's very cool, but very begrudgingly, I give it a thumbs down. I wouldn't take it. But what do you guys think? Let me know down in that comment section below. Do you agree with me or do you think, Morning Glory, Hellhammer's amazing? Let me know. All right, but let's move on to the next Super Heavy. So moving on, we're actually staying in the expensive realm and we're going with the Shadow Sword, which comes in at 430 points. Now, the Shadow Sword is probably the second most popular Super Heavy you see in Guard Armies. The Bane Blade being the classic quintessential that nearly everyone has. Most people then, after they've got a Bane Blade, go, you know what, I'm going to get a Shadow Sword. And there's a reason for that. They're actually really good and they do a fantastic job and they can be at times very, very anti-meta because these things are basically designed to pick up knights, okay? Now, we are in a knight meta at the moment, but there are baby knights, so I'm not sure the Shadow Sword really benefits because I don't believe they've got the Titanic keyword, the baby knights. Let me know down in the comment section below. I'm not entirely sure. But anyway, the Shadow Sword, to be clear, it does not come with the Marsh Cannon or the Auto Cannon or even that last gun that the Hellhammer came with, okay? Now... That's a pretty pr hefty price tag, 430 points to not get all the cool extra guns. I mean, like, the Bane Blade is 20 points cheaper than this thing and comes with a Dimash Cannon and an Auto Cannon. So this thing must have a pretty Gucci gun if it's going to be any good, okay? And I'm not going to lie to you, it is a good gun. So it's got 120 inch range, which is more, more, more than enough. It has a heavy 3D3 number of shots. Now, that's really good. It is a potentially low number of shots. It's not a D6 but it is a very reliable number of shots. Heavy 3d3 means that you can pretty much guarantee you're gonna be getting six shots out of this thing every single time. And reliability, you guys know I put a big, big thumbs up when it comes to reliability. Knowing what your unit is going to be doing every turn and being able to factor that into your long-term plans and your game plan is very, very important. So heavy 3d3, it gets a big thumbs up from me because of that. Now, it also has a strength of 16, which is the highest strength of any of the Super Heavy Guns. It's AP5, which is higher than the Hellhammer. In fact, again, that's one of the highest ones we've seen. And its damage is 2d6, which is fantastic. Not 2d6, but the highest, just 2d6. And you can reroll failed wound rolls when targeting Titanic units with this weapon, which is just really, 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 really nice. So if it hits and wounds, which it should do, it should wound anything in the game on a 2 plus, basically, including knights. If you shoot this thing at a knight, it's wounding it on a 2 plus with reroll, so it's going to wound it. You're getting 2d6, which means this thing does an average of 7 damage. Now, I don't, I'm not a big fan of the 2d6 damage because, again, we, you know, unreliability, but it is still, it has the potentially the highest damage out of any weapon we've seen so far, so it's pretty good. Now, it also comes with a special rule Shadow Sword Targeters. Add one to any hit rolls you make this model for shooting attacks that target Titanic units. So, look guys, it's a really, really good unit for killing knights, but it is quite specialised. It is quite expensive. However, I can't think of a time when knights haven't been in the meta. Knights are always going to be a thing in the meta, okay? So, for me, I think the Shadow Sword gets a thumbs up. And that really comes down to the fact that it has a very good roll. It has an inbuilt ability to get plus one to hit, which is very nicely normally only hits on fours. And even when it does only hit on fours, when it, it, it is the philosophy, it embodies philosophy of go big or go home. So it's got a reliable number of shots. It's going to wound anything in the game on twos. Nothing unless it's going to get saved unless it's got an invulnerable save. It does a high amount of damage. It has its own source of inbuilt rerolls and a plus one to hit against certain targets. Overall, it gets the, the thumbs up from me. Now, it's getting the recommendation. It's a good super heavy that you can fit into most lists. Look, anything you point that gun at, it's going to kill. And that's just, 
That's great, and it's pretty reliable as well. So yeah, it gets a thumbs up from me. I can recommend it. So moving on, we come across another quite expensive Super Heavy, the Storm Lord. Now the Storm Lord definitely gets the prize for probably being the coolest Super Heavy. It's just, it's just cool, okay? It's got a big twin Gatling gun sticking out the front of it, and that just warms my heart, okay? The problem is that it's actually not a very good unit. I'm just gonna say that straight off the bat, right? It comes with two heavy stubbers, a twin heavy bolter, and a Vulcan mega bolter, which is normally reserved for Titans, okay? So it's cool. Now, it does have a massive firing deck. It has actually has an extended firing deck of up to 20 models being transported by Storm or can shoot out of it. So it can hold 40 and 20 can shoot out of the top, which is pretty nice. Now, in terms of its firepower, as I said, it comes with two heavy stubbers, which is all right. It comes with the twin heavy bolts, which is all right. It does not come with the Marsh Cannon, and it does not come with the Auto Cannon, though. But the Vulcan Mega Bolt has a 60-inch range. It's heavy 20. It's strength 6. It's AP minus 2, and it is damage 2. Now, it's not a bad unit, but I think the problem with the Stormlord is that it gets judged very harshly, and I judge it as well, but the problem is that it just used to be so much better. It used to get a rule where if it stood still, it got to fire twice, which is just so good, okay? The problem is, is that it sort of still feels like GW is making it pay for that without giving it much benefit. Or maybe they're making it pay out the nose because of the extended firing deck. I don't know. Look, on the surface, the Stormlord should be good. But the problem is, is that it's only got a ballistic skill of a 4 plus at best. Its gun really isn't that powerful. Yes, it's 20 shots, but I know I've got other guns that get 20 shots. I've got Daka Primes. I've got Punisher Cannons that get 20 shots, okay? Strength 6 is okay, but it's nothing to write home about. AP2 is, is pretty good, at least in terms of Arm of Contempt, but stacking up against other Super Heavies, is it any better than what they get? I don't know. I don't think so. And the Damage 2 is, again, okay, but the moment you come across something that reduces damage by 1, the gun starts losing potency very, very quickly. Look, I could go on about the Stormlord it, uh, for ages. At the end of the day, guys, it just needs one simple fix. It just needs a points decrease. More so than any of the other ones, it really needs a points decrease because its damage output just isn't that good, okay? So I really think that this thing should have a points cost of like 350 points. I know that seems insane, but what you've got to remember is its main gun isn't doing a huge amount of firepower. The main firepower of this thing is going to come from the extra sponsors you put on it and the people you're going to put in the back. But you've got to pay for those people that go in the back, remember? So, yeah, I can put 40 people, I can put 20 guns in the back of this thing that can shoot out, but I need to pay for those 20 guns. So that's why I think it needs to have a significant decrease to reflect that if you're going to get the most out of this, you're going to have to spend more points than elsewhere. So... Moving on to the last of the Super Heavies that we're going to be reviewing today, we have the Storm Sword. Now, I genuinely can't think of a single time that I've seen anyone take this unit. I actually forget it exists a lot of the time, which is kind of sad, but it's just a bit... It's a bit meh, to be honest, guys. It's 400 points, so it's not super expensive, but it's not super cheap either. It does not come with the Demarche Cannon or the Auto Cannon or the Lance Gun. It comes with the Storm Sword Siege Cannon and it comes with a twin heavy bolter, okay? Now, the Storm Sword Siege Cannon has only got a 36 inch range. You know what I feel about that. It's got heavy 2d6. You know what I feel about that, guys. It's strength 10, it's okay. It's AP4, which is okay. It's damage d6, which is very swingy. Units attacked by this weapon do not gain any bonus to their saving throws to be in cover. Okay, that's nice. But its main thing is reroll damage rolls of one for this weapon. I mean, it's. I mean, that's okay, I guess, but flat damage would be better, or minimum damage of three would be better. Look, it's just, it's got short range, it's got not enough shots. I, I just, it's not that cheap either. The fact that it's 400 points is not that cheap. It doesn't come with a firing deck. It's, honestly, I if I had to put my money on one, if I had to say which one was the worst out of all of them, we, we haven't saved the best or the last, we've certainly saved the worst or the last. There's not much I can say about the Storm Sword. I just do not like it. I do not like it. it just it. What can I say? Personally, I think it's the worst one out of all of them. But maybe I'm missing a trick here, guys. Let me know down in the comment section below. What do you think about the Storm Sword? I mean, it's, this is the shortest review out of all the Super we're doing. It just seems... Sorry, it just seems really shit. <laughs> but what do you guys think? Let me know.
But that's all we've got time for today. I actually want to give a quick honourable mention to the Stormblade. It's a Forge World Super Heavy. That's very similar to all of these Bane Blade type ones that we've looked at today. It's on the Bane Blade chassis. But I've already done a video on that and I'm going to link it at the end of this one. So if you want to see more Super Heavy content and you want to see my thoughts on the Stormblade, which I actually think, spoiler, it's pretty bloody good if you go and check the video out, then please follow the link at the end of this video. Now, that's all we've got time for today. But before we go, please comment down below and let me know what you think about this video and what I've talked about today. Do you agree with the ones that I've thumbs up and thumbs down? Do you think that I've totally missed any tricks? Do you think that I'm out of my mind? Let me know down in the comments section below. If you have enjoyed today's video, then please consider giving it a like and a subscribe and all that kind of good stuff. To be totally honest with you, any extra interactivity you can give this video will give it a big boost with the YouTube algorithm. The all-knowing yet mysterious machine spirit that determines which videos do well and which videos don't. So I'd be really grateful for any extra interactivity you can give this video. Now, if you've really enjoyed today's video and you want to see more content like this, then please consider becoming a channel member or Patreon supporter. It is thanks to my channel members and my patrons that I'm able to put out as much content that I do, cover all the topics that I do cover. So if you want to see more of this kind of stuff then please consider becoming a channel member or patreon supporter and i just want to take a moment to give a shout out and a thank you to all of our latest channel members and patreon supporters so a big thank you to al craft atremius let's play funny creature lachlan coles scott gregory nick smith the goggles they do nothing author 15a trevor lane joseph wrigley guiana carlo death to the gray Witch Hunter Guy, Moritz, Polaris Eternia, Lehman Russ, Lax Comics, Joe Ken, Aiden, Commissar Falk, and Malcolm Brown. Thank you all of you guys for being channel members. Thank you for doing your part. I also want to say a big thank you to all of our latest Patreon supporters as well. So a big thank you to Antonio, DK126, Polaris, Jacob Holden, The Major 91, Matt Stanley, and Alice O'Neill. Thank you guys. I really appreciate all of the support that you've shown me. Now, last but certainly not least, I want to say a personal, heartfelt thank you to all of my top tier Patreon supporters. These are the people that have truly gone above and beyond their call of duty when it comes to supporting my channel. And I am eternally grateful for all of the support they've shown me. These are the War Masters. So a big thank you, a big 07 down in the comment section, guys, for Navy Veteran, Philip French, Ross Miller, Alex Stengal, John Stubbs, Nicholas Walsh, Swordfish Trombone, Diesel Fox, Tom Sutton, and August Varney. Massive thank you to all of these guys. Their support is truly humbling. And I know I say it's a lot, but it's mind-blowing. It's, it's just amazing. So thank you so much, guys. I really, honestly, I can't express it. And if I wish I knew English better, man, like, I know it's my first language, but I wish I knew more words just to express, like, thank you. Thank you. It's incredible. I hope you've all enjoyed today's video. Thank you for watching. And of course, as always, I'll see you guys next time.